when I talked to Jim that very first time, he wanted me to, to do some comparisons between where he was and, and the counties south of it. And so I pulled together some of the numbers from both our states. And you know, things look fairly similar in those, those two areas, the three counties in Iowa and then the three zones in, in Minnesota. Similar, you know, Minnesota's area is a little bit smaller, so they end up you know, shooting more deer per square mile. So there's more hunting pressure overall, about 50% more when you look at it. Percent bucks in those in those two areas are directly comparable. There's a uh, very similar uh, number of bucks and does in the harvest. Uh, again, when you adjust that for harvest per square mile, it's a little bit different. Um, again, Minnesota has higher harvest than Iowa does. More people, more deer hunters, more hunting pressure. Total kill, similar ratios again, and, and one of the things you see is that the gradient of habitat changes from east to west, you get fewer harvest because you've got less deer habitat, same thing in Iowa. That ratio, we still, you know, even on some of our highest, you know, Albuquerque is one of our highest deer kill counties, you get 6.3 uh, deer kill per square mile, which is, you know, pretty high. Clayton would be right below, it would be a little bit higher than that, actually. <clears throat> Buck kill, same kind of thing. 50% higher hunting pressure so they can bear die. By weapons type, <coughs> firearm, archery, muzzleloader, proportionally on the left, very similar. 14% during the archery season, about 8 to 10% during the muzzleloader season, the vast majority during the fire season. So not a big difference that way either. The harvest per square mile again emphasizes that difference in pressure. There's you know, just more pressure in Minnesota. And this is kind of what Kip was talking about, the changes through time of what was done and seen in Iowa. When I started back in the 80s, we were actually in a, a point where we were transitioning from the traditional protect our deer to trying to get a stable population. We tried to, to bring things down then, and we, we think we did through the mid 90s, and then we were slow to react in the late 90s. If we could have bumped our harvest up a little bit in the late 90s, we would have we, we've gone through some really tough political times from 2003 till 2006 with a lot of pressure from the legislature to drastically reduce deer herds. And today, I think that we've got the confidence back from those people that we can do what we're, we're telling them and what we're doing is working. Uh, now it's going to be where can we find a, a level to settle at that everybody's comfortable with. So we, we think we're getting there for the most part. We're still always going to have challenges in, in what we do. <laughs> the one big difference that's obvious between us and you is um, our seasons occur at a different time. And, and that's a historical reasoning, not because we thought it would be great for quality deer management or anything. It was because we had a great pheasant season in November and there was still corn out. And the thinking was, and from our, our hunters and from our farmers, that they really didn't want deer season to start until December after the corn was all picked back in 1950. So we established that tradition and it's, it's stayed right through. When we went to the split shotgun seasons, we tried to move one of those seasons up into the Thanksgiving weekend. Think that went over good? And people were just going, the phone lines were hot. They were, <laughs> you guys screwed up, and we were getting it from both sides. The hunters didn't like it, the landers didn't like it, and the wives didn't like it. Uh, the family members. <laughs> that was my Thanksgiving. You screwed up my Thanksgiving. And so we tried it two years. You know, we were we didn't learn once. We had to do it twice. <laughs> and, we it. and so we went back to, to that season and December season. Uh, the, our shotgun hunters are the bread and butter of our program. They provide the majority of the harvest. Um, some people are very critical of them that they aren't as quality deer management oriented as the rest of the groups, but I think one of the things that you're hearing is that from education, not just from us, but from organizations from uh, the, the, the writing community are explaining to them so that they're more knowledgeable on how to achieve what they really want. They want to see more deer, more, buck, uh, more adult 
mature deer. Uh, but they want to have fun too. Most of them hunt one, one weekend. And the majority of them, even then, they still 40% of them kill a doe. So they're not that, we don't have that Pennsylvania mentality that the first buck is the only deer they're going to shoot. There are people that way, but that's not the overall uh, consensus. We do get a lot of criticism from our January hunters. Um, we're shooting some shit antler bucks. People do not like that. Um, it's accomplishing our dope kill, and it's one of the things that we can shorten. But what I try to explain to them is that we're starting to shoot shed antlers bucks back in December. And the proportion that we're shooting in the harvest really doesn't change during that time. So unless we move it all the way up into October or November, which we tried. November has been one of our least popular seasons, too. We did that Thanksgiving thing again. We didn't learn, but we put it in that weekend after Thanksgiving. We did avoid Thanksgiving Day. We went Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, it's still not a popular season. Uh, it steps on bow hunters' toes. It steps on some pheasant hunters' toes. It steps on some family traditions. Uh, it, it does help, and it maybe helped us go over the the, the edge on, on some of our areas, but that's really the, the nuts and bolts of why we do what we do where we do it. There's things that we don't know about, and we've talked about this in the past and with Lou, you know, how can we maybe do some comparisons that we mean of meeting people on uh, both sides of the border to see how our land ownership and, and habitat patterns different, or are they? kind of uh, surveys we could do that Lou's doing in uh, hunter attitudes and landowner attitudes. And then the big one is, is what everybody talks about is traditions. You know, our hunting has evolved over time. Um, our hunters like what they do. Um, there's some of them would love to hunt in November with a firearm, but it would be hard for us to change to that right now. I don't know that we could get that done a lot of controversy with landowners. So it would be a, a big hurdle for us to go all the way into November with that season. And I don't think we really want to. So I mean, we could. But, and one of the things I've learned over 20 some years is never say never heard may happen. But, <laughs> so I'm not sure what I've, I've done here today and Jim made a, it sound like I was some oracle of knowledge, which I'm not. Uh, I give you a little bit of a picture of what's out there. It's still pretty fuzzy in my mind, but we, we struggle through. But what we try to do in our agency is try to work with our, our constituents, you know, people like yourselves who are here. Uh, this is one of the more important things in your uh, life as far as activities you want to do. It's like golf to some people, deer hunting, bass fishing. Those are all pursuits that people are very attached to March Madness. It's, it's, it's just something that people are, are very uh, into and working with the people who are into it is really the best thing we can do to, to make sure we all go forward. And QDMA is a good vehicle in our minds to do some of these things. 